and I know I can speak for, uh, for Jack and Ken, to say that we always know that what comes from this pulpit is going to be right on, right on target. David, come speak to us. Let me say a word about the man and brother who led us in prayer tonight, Brother Alan Lawson. He and his wife Lily are with us. It's been a long time since Alan and I first met. When we moved in August of 1977 to work with the Eastside Church of Christ Muskogee, his parents and uh, sister were there. It wasn't long before we met him. And uh, for a church south of Muskogee, Porham, Oklahoma, and that's quite a time to preach. I've never known him to be anything but straight down the line. I heard years ago Brother Guy and Woods say at that time, which was quite a while ago, that among the churches of Oklahoma, he had found that his work as a gospel preacher working throughout that area for years, so many brethren at that stage who were so faithful and determined to be what the Bible says they ought to be. Well, I don't know that that can be said about any group of brethren in a statewide situation anywhere today, but there are still people who love the Lord. There are still people who will serve Him no matter what it costs them to be obedient to His will, to preach it, and to defend it. And Brother Allen has been one of those people, and I'm grateful that he's here, and it's great to see him. We welcome all of you here. And as far as our elders go, I could go a good while about them. Any one of them can stand in this pulpit and do as well as a great many preachers can do, and a whole lot better than some. And brother, when Brother Roth said a moment ago when we were getting started, if uh, we could get certain elders and certain preachers to sit down, we could get going. Well, I thought about that. You know, that's true. Throughout the brotherhood, you can get certain elders and preachers to sit down. We could get going. But on the other hand, if you get certain elders and preachers to stand up, we could get going. It's just a matter of who ought to stand, who ought to sit. And we're interested in those who are faithful in all things. And I believe this is the case with the eldership of the spring congregation. Uh, we, I've seen them operate, and when it comes to the obligatory matters of truth, they have not been moved from it. We love them for their work's sake for the opportunity to work with them and to have a church. The brethren at Spring, after all these years, that make up the Spring Congregation are here because they choose to be. And that says a whole lot concerning the stand that we've taken over the years, but we're thankful for everybody. I remember back in the 1960s when I was somewhat younger than I am now, when I looked a little more like Alan saw me when I first met. Alan hadn't changed much. I think I've changed all the more than Alan. But when I was a much uh, younger preacher, Billy Graham was as popular then as he ever was. And there was a big to-do in the United States in the summer of whatever year it was, in the 60s, this late 60s, where they had this big push going on. You know, he was all for crusades, as they called them in those days. And I never will forget, the motto was, one finger like this, Jesus, yes. Guess what the rest of it was? The church? No. Now, why would anybody make such a statement as that? Purporting to be a friend of God and his good word and that Jesus Christ is his Lord and King and Savior. Knowing what the Bible has to say about the church. Well, the truth of the matter is, that is the typical sectarian denominational perspective and view of the church. This book, for the most part, among those that claim God as their Father, Jesus as their Savior and King, and claim to be His servants, is basically something that just makes them feel pretty good. It's almost like some sort of icon. If they can have it around them, if it can be in their house, and if they can read certain passages in it, then they're all right. Everything's fine with them and their God. I'm sorry to say that 
It's like that in many members of the church nowadays when it used to be basically those outside the church who were of the denominational persuasion. And that's because we've apostatized in our understanding of the pure doctrine of Christ on the church of Christ. I ask all here this evening and those who will hear this sermon anywhere to take heed what they hear, as Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 24. And you ought to do it all the time concerning spiritual matters. Be sure it's God's word right and dividing that you're hearing. Then Jesus also said in Luke 8 and verse 18, take heed how you hear it. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear it. Now I hope you'll keep that in mind throughout all these sermons, these lectures, and any others that you may ever hear. Take heed what you hear, and take heed how you hear it. Are you hearing this as the Word of God that you need, and do you have your Bible open, reading it, and studying along with us as we go into this study of the New Testament church? There's a reason that we put New Testament in front of church to be the topic of discussion at this time. And that reason is simply to set it apart from all those churches founded and sustained upon the commandments and doctrines of men. If you believe in God and the Christ and the Bible, then you must accept what the Bible says on salvation and you must accept what it says about the church. There's no way to glorify the Christ And not glorify everything pertaining to what he did in order to save us and what's connected with our salvation from our sins. When you look in his earthly ministry, Matthew chapter 16, you'll find in verse 13, and Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. When he did that, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they say, I always say the some says come out when you ask people about things. Some say. Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it continues on saying to Peter, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now I'd like to start from the last verse and work back up through it. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, literally, when you study the Greek, it's saying uh, whatever is bound in heaven is the only thing you're going to be allowed to bind on earth. And whatever is loosed in heaven is the only thing you're going to be allowed to loose on earth because the authority comes from heaven. Now, if you want to know what translation that's from, just mark it down DPB 38 or 238 or 538 or whatever. That's just a loose, but I promise you, it is a true translation of what Jesus is saying. Now, I say that because people, people will go, as we go up verse 18, they'll look at Peter. And, of course, the Catholic Church says the church was built on Peter. And we've long pointed out that uh, Peter came from a Greek masculine uh, word, Petros, that means a pebble or a stone. And yet, uh, when you look at the rock that he said he would build his church on, that's from Petra, and it means a great foundation stone. 
one that could support a building. In effect, what he's saying is, Peter, though you are but a pebble, I will build my church upon a solid foundation. And what is it? Well, we move back up. And we see that Jesus pronounced a blessing because the Father revealed something to Peter. Now, what was it? The confession that thou art the Christ, the anointed one. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the foundation upon which the church is built that Jesus promised to build, that foundation is Jesus himself. That's what Peter confessed, and that's why Jesus himself said the church would be built upon, not upon Peter. Well, as you go back earlier in these verses, you'll see that when you turn to men to get the answers, as I said earlier, the some says come out. You ask people, what do you think about this? You're allowed to hear anything. Sometimes people will ask us in the church, what does the church of Christ believe about this? My answer is anything and everything. You've asked the wrong question. The question is, what does the Bible teach about it? Now you say, well, why would you say members of the church would uh, say about anything as answer to a question? Because people, number one, are at different degrees of knowledge. Others are simply unfaithful. And whatever you way you want to call it, uh, Paul must have had that in mind. Some are just ignorant when he said, I would not have you ignorant read. Well, we're all ignorant of some things, but listen. Concerning matters of salvation, God does not expect us to be ignorant, and we can be thoroughly enlightened to learn how to go to heaven and to know the way and to know that we believe the right thing and that we've done the right thing. If not, you tell me why you studied the Bible and why you're here this evening or anything else pertaining to the church or your activity in it. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, that if you continue in his word, then are you his disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, he told a lie, or he told the truth, didn't he? Jesus also said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. And he said in John 12, verse 28, that the word would be the standard of judgment on the last great day. Now, God being a thoroughly just God, as fair as fair can ever be fair, for he's the standard of fairness, then he's not going to tell you that the word is something that will judge you and then say, but they really can't understand it anyway. Uh, I wouldn't serve God like that. Nobody else should. But that's not the God revealing himself in the Bible, and he's not the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, he's not your heavenly father. We're reading about our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the church that He built. So if we go to men to find out anything, we won't find out the same thing. Thus, the New Testament church. What does that mean? I'm going to the New Testament. And I'm going to learn about the church that Jesus built in the primary source the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man, the Bible in general, and the New Testament in particular. Now, somebody says, you can take that to the bank. So we are not interested in what the church fathers said, those folks that lived the first few hundred years after the first century. They had the same source we had, have, and that is the New Testament. So whatever they could learn about the church, they're going to have to learn it from the New Testament too. Obviously, they didn't, and many people were not following the teaching of the New Testament even in the first century. Paul even refers to how the mystery of iniquity now worketh in departing from the faith. He warns Timothy that some would depart from the faith, the system of faith that really is the New Testament. What he in reality is saying is some will depart from the New Testament. He's telling Jews, contend for the faith, contend for the New Testament system. Well, that was before it was even completely written. He's having to tell people, stand up for it. There are people who are turning against it. He has to tell the elders at Ephesus that men shall arise from among your own selves to draw away disciples after them. 
And they do it by teaching perverse things. So from the time the New Testament was being revealed early on, warning after warning was coming, there will be those in the church who will leave the faith. Well, what are we going to do? We have what a lot of people don't write, but I, I still say it anyway because it's the truth. A divine pattern. I'm amazed at these folks who don't like the word pattern, and they even talk about patternism. And I always think, well, I guess they have a pattern to be opposed to a pattern. And they do. They follow a pattern. All you're saying when you follow a pattern or a blueprint is that we have that which teaches us how to do. God has his pattern. It's even used by the writer of Hebrews in stemming the apostasy of Jewish Christians when he reminds them that God gave a pattern to Moses and that he was to make all things according to the pattern. And you know that was written before time for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. Uh, so we have uh, our Lord's own pattern. He who said he would build his church, C-H-U-R-C-H, one church. Yeah, but I look around me and see all these different people, all these different churches. Well, quit looking around you and go back to the last will and testament of he who said he would build, it, build his church and he who did build it. Go back to the one who's head of it, the one who shed his blood purchase it. And listen to his will on the matter and not what anybody else says. I can tell you one thing that The devil being against uh, mankind as strongly as anybody could ever be against them and wanting everybody to be lost and working to that end day in and day out all day long and all night long. Don't you think he would want to corrupt the teaching of the New Testament concerning the church that Jesus built? Don't you think he would aim at it from every direction and try to destroy every identifying mark of the New Testament church. Now when we look at the word church, let's try to understand as simply as we can what it is by defining. The church is a body of those who have believed in Christ, believed Him to be the Son of God, which belief or faith came from the New Testament, Romans 10, 17. These believers, in taking all the Bible said in becoming a Christian, repented of their sins. They did, as it were, a complete about face from a practice, habitual life of sin and simply living for themselves and the flesh to the will of Christ, to follow it, even to the point of dying for the Lord rather than to stop being faithful to Him according to the New Testament. These then confess their faith before men that Christ is the Son of God. And they were baptized, immersed in water into Christ. Galatians 3.27, Romans 6, 3 and 4. In order to obtain the remission of the forgiveness of their sins that they had committed and had separated them from God. Acts 22, 16, and Acts 2, verse 38. The Lord took them himself and added them to his church. They didn't join any church of Christ as that term is defined and used in the scriptures. And as we're speaking of it now regarding matters of salvation. The denominational concept simply says there's one great invisible body of Christ made up of all the denominations and all the different views that exist. No matter how much they contradict one another. I had a fellow just recently tell me, why didn't we leave all these folks alone just tend their own business? Well, I think that is our business. If I understand the New Testament Great Commission and contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It's the business of members of the church to enlighten the world according to the truth. And that means you expose error. No way on earth you can put a new building right where this one is and leave this one standing. You cannot do it. And if you tried, it sure would be a mess. 
I don't think I'd want in it. Well, when you have people who are believing and have believed for years false doctrine about salvation, the church, God, Christ, they have got to give that stuff up. Now, if they're honest, they won't give it up until they learn that it's error, it's contrary to the truth, and that's going to send me to torment. Now, the churches of Christ over the years have ceased, in general, from preaching that way. Because we bought into this idea that people just won't listen to that. You're, you're coming across as haughty and mean and hateful and unloving. Well, I'm sorry. You just told me I was wrong. Did that make you unloving and harsh and mean and hateful? Seems to work for you all right in exposing me. I remember here Brother G.K. Wallace say one time, said the liberal modernist says you can't take the Bible and get after anybody with it. He said, but they don't mind taking it and trying to get after me with it. And that's exactly the inconsistency of people today. It's real. I told a fellow on the phone one time, he was saying, you shouldn't do that, the kind of thing I just described. I said, you do it. Well, he was offended. Oh, he was highly offended. I said, uh, why did you call me today? You have something to tell me? And you, literally, you begin to hear stuttering on the other end of the phone. Finally, dawns on him. I called you to tell you you were wrong. And what you're wrong about is telling other people they're wrong. But it's all right for me to tell you you're wrong. It's just not all right for you to tell me that I'm wrong. Well, if there was hypocrisy, that's it. That's all there is to it. It's strange to me that people will say, well, we are just all be for God. Okay, what God? <laughs> Which God are you going to be for? Allah or Jehovah God Almighty? And I tell you they're not the same, though they are said to be the same by certain people. So it's a matter of truth, brethren. Truth. Truth of God's Word. Church is a body of penitent, baptized believers who've confessed their faith in Christ before their baptism. They've been called out of the world by the gospel of Christ, the power of God that uh, saves men when they obey the gospel. Christ reigns over this church, He's the head of this church. And it is led, guided, and directed by the Holy Spirit through the word of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And this is the significance of that word church as the Lord used it in Matthew 16, 18 when he said, I will build my church. And thus, when that term is used in that way, it includes all the Lord's faithful followers on the earth. But in right and abiding the word of truth, we must look at the way the church is used wherever it's used in the New Testament. And we find that the word church is also used to designate congregations of faithful believers from whatever geographical point, even when it doesn't name the specific, uh, specific place, such as the churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. Or specifically the church in Rome, the church in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch, or the church in spring. We need to understand it's that simple. It also designates an assembly of Christians, such as this one, convened for religious purposes. If you turn over and read 1 Corinthians 11, where he's talking about the abuse of the Lord's Supper and correcting the Corinthians in their abuses, and he talks about what they did when they came together in one place. You can't get the worldwide universal church together in one place every Sunday. But the largest and smallest organized entity of the one church in which are all the saved that Jesus saves and nobody else, the largest and small, smallest organized entity is the church's geographic location like this congregation. And by the way, the word congregation means the same thing as the word church. So we have elders and deacons when the church is fully organized according to the teaching of the New Testament. They have qualifications to meet. They have work to do. The elders, the pastors, the presbyters, the bishops, they are the overseers. They are the superintendents. They are to see that what God obligates the church to do is done the quickest and best way possible. And to guard then the truth. 
in that church. They are to always strive that Christ is magnified as the gospel magnifies him. That all things are done decently and in order as that is specified by the authority of the New Testament, that all things are done by the authority of Jesus Christ, Colossians 3.17. And thus we've said so often, there must be a thus saith the Lord for everything we believe in practice, or it's sinful if we do it. That is, we must have Bible authority for what we believe in practice. If it's not authorized by the Lord in his last will and testament, we have no business engaging in it. Or if it's forbidden, we have no business engaging in it. If we do, we sin. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. So there's a general sense that the church is used in the New Testament. There is a geographical sense, and there's a symbol. Or there is a congregational sense in which the word church finds usage in the New Testament. I've already referred you to the church in the general sense as it is used by Jesus in Matthew 16, 18. And I say again, as that, there is but one church. As there is but one body of Christ, as Paul teaches in God's great platform for unity, set out in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. One church, one body, one kingdom. There are as many churches acceptable to the Father in heaven as there are lords acceptable to the Father in heaven. And that's just the truth of it. All congregations, these in different geographic locations, as we described it earlier, are of the same faith and practice. Thus they constitute the one worldwide body of Christ. The church in its general sense. I say again that the denominational concept of the invisible church is wholly unknown in the New Testament. Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Now think about that for a minute. It's not difficult. Jesus purchased his church with his own blood. Is there a purchase price for the Lord's church? There is. Now what is it? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. What does that tell us about the value or worth of the church? It's worth the purchase price. When people rise up and say, Jesus, yes, the church, no. Or that you're saved by personal relation with Jesus and you pick out whichever one of these churches suits you the best and you get in it because the church really has no bearing on your salvation. They don't know what the Bible teaches for whatever reason. They don't know it. We have to understand that you're belittling and making light of and blaspheming the blood of Christ when you say the church that he built is insignificant. Because it was the blood of Christ that purchased it. And the thing is worse, the purchase price. Christ thought so. Who wants to argue with him by calling him King, Lord, Master, and Savior? His last will and testament teaches us that. Will we be taught is what it comes down to. So to assert that the church is non-essential is in effect to say that Christ's blood was shed unnecessarily. If it is possible to be saved without the church, and the church was purchased by the blood of Christ, then it's possible literally to be saved without the blood of Christ. Indeed, without him being a Christian. And yet these folks will say, oh, we ought to be Christians, whatever the concept of it is. And Christ is our Savior, and how grateful we are that he shed his blood to purchase us. But he purchased the church. But you say the church is not essential. Well, I would say any church built upon the commandments and doctrines of men and propagated thereby, yeah, it's not essential. In fact, it's wrong, and if you're part of it, you'll be condemned with it. Now you say, well, that's awful bold. No, the Bible's bold, brethren. You mark this down. 
the more ignorant we get of the truth of the Bible and the further removed the church is from days gone by when it was common practice for the elders and the deacons and the members who were truly faithful and certainly the preachers to speak plainly as I'm speaking now, they have not heard it so long that even the truth sounds harsh and mean and hateful. I'll tell you what, the truth sounds terrible when it condemns you. It always has. It always will. The truth will sound terrible to the criminal. When that judge sentences the convicted criminal, I'm sure he's just so happy to hear that sentence. It just warms the cockles of his heart. And if it's when they had the electric chair, they'd be a lot more warm than that when the sentence was carried out. And when he entered into torment, there's no description of the terrible ordeal of the lost people there. And yet people will hear the truth and they don't like it because it condemns them. How does it condemn them? They're believing something contrary to it. And they now learned it and now they've got to make a choice. I'm going to now change my ways and my likes and turn to what I've now learned the Bible to teach. Or I'm going to hold on to what is contrary to the truth because I like it. The head of the church I've already mentioned is nobody but Jesus Christ. Anybody says they're a member of the church and they're saying that the blood of Christ didn't purchase it or the church is non-essential, all of that, you know that they can't be faithful to the Lord in those things. The same is true of the head of the church. The Lord's church has only one head, and that head is Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Paul wrote, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. In Matthew 28, 18 and 20, the Lord said, All power or authority hath been given unto me. Well, that's mighty proud of you to declare that to us. Listen, somebody must have all authority. And that has to be God. I listened last night, I was telling Ken about to a debate. Uh, on atheism over in the University of Birmingham, England. And I said to you in a sermon here not long ago that everybody that says God does not exist, and I'm here to tell you that, every one of those fellows want to be God. Now, if you ask them, do you want to be God? They'd laugh. But it was long into this to where he was saying, I just don't see why God won't do it that way. It seems like to me he ought to do it this way. That's always been the problem. Folks, that, that's exactly why the devil's the devil. He never did like it because God was God. And he flew right in God's face. And how can you identify then a child of the devil? It's not going to take him long to fly into the face of God. Well, he literally can't get to the face of God, but he sure can give his word fits. And so he attacks what he can get to. And if you believe it and live it and preach it, He's going to get you. That's just the way life is. Folks, it's wickedness of the most rebellious nature for human conferences and synods and conventions of men to attempt to exercise powers and privileges which belong to God and the Christ since he has all authority alone. Uh, and reading your Bible sometime, the Old Testament, New Testament, as you go through the unfolding of the scheme of redemption and see God's dealing with man down through time, notice in every case he is strongly against anybody who adds to his word or takes away from it. Now what does that say about us today? So faithful disciples gladly submit to the will of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 1 John 2 and verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, gets the greatest promotion. <laughs> is a liar. And the truth's not in him. The church of which Christ is head is his body, I've said. Colossians 1, 18. He's the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All scriptural blessings are in this body, Ephesians 1, 3. And we've already seen there is but one such body, wherein all those spiritual blessings are, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. 
I want to conclude with these terms. I've always said that if you want to know a lot about the church that you read of the New Testament, the Lord's church, the church of Christ. You ought to notice the various terms the Holy Spirit used to tell us about and teach us about Christ. The scriptures refer to the church by referring to it as the house of God, Hebrews 3.6. The temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. A spiritual house, Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. Speaks of it as the habitation of God in Ephesians 2, 20 through 22. God's husbandry, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. It's referred to even as God's flock in 1 Peter 5, 2. The body of Christ that we've mentioned, Colossians 1, 18. The pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 and and verse number 15, the church of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And I've mentioned several times already the churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16. These designations, all referring to the church that you read of in your own New Testament, indicate aspects, and this is where they get important, aspects of the same body. As an organism possessing life, it is the body of Christ. As a government, it is his kingdom. As a place of worship, it is the temple of God. As a, and this might come as a shock to some brethren, as a place of work, it's a husbandry. As uh, God's house, it's a family of which we sang about a while ago. As the pillar and ground of the truth, it is the support of the same, and so on. So much can be learned about the church through these terms. So they did, these terms set out to us the divine nature, the divine organization, and the divine work of the one church that is of Christ to the glory of God the Father. Children of God, Christians constitute the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And of course, I've already pointed out that Christ is his head. More could be said, and there's a lot more in the book. I didn't even take the approach here tonight that is set out in the book. And every one of these speakers will be able to say that about their chapters. I want you to understand that when you talk about the church that is of Christ as it's revealed on the pages of the New Testament, you're talking about something worth so much. And what is it? The blood of Christ. That means every member in particular is worth a whole lot. When we were baptized by the death of Christ to become Christians, we were baptized into his death. It was in his death where he shed his blood. And if you want the blood of Christ applied to you so your sins will be remitted, then you must comply with the terms in God's plan of salvation. It's that simple. Someday, and it can't be long for some of us, maybe a little longer for others, but in the way time goes by, it's very close. There shall loom before us not what's going on in Washington and who's going to be president, but a vast eternity unending. And how we live here determines where we shall be there. Because when we get into eternity, that's it. We're going to always be wherever we go in eternity. There's no looking for any other place. Those who die in rebellion to God must forever and ever toss and turn in the great fires of torment because they were rebellious and they would not hear, believe, and obey the gospel. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus yet says, while the sun still shines, while time goes on, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly and hard, and you shall find rest in your souls. You'll be a member of the church when you obey the gospel, the church that Jesus built. Heaven someday will be your home on the basis of your steadfast adherence to the truth, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Thank you for your kind attention. David, thank you very much. We appreciate that great deal. I believe that since the title of our, our lectureship this year includes the word counterfeit, I'm sure you've heard the, the saying that 
and many, many of you will use it in your lesson that the, the best way to recognize anything that's counterfeit is to be thoroughly, completely understanding and familiar with the real thing. And I think it behooves us all to, to study, to understand what the real thing consists of. David did a good job of, of starting that off tonight. It occurs to me also that uh, one of the best ways to destroy the monetary system in, of, or any monetary system is to flood it with counterfeits. And I think you all understand that that's what the devil has attempted to do, is to flood the world with counterfeit churches. And I believe we'll be dealing with that in a, a good bit in this lectureship. Thank you for your attention. We stand adjourned until the top of the hour.